There is probably no one who does not feel the highest respect for Beethoven's art and biography. For many people, he is the artist par excellence, striving for the highest ideals despite all adversities that he had to endure during his lifetime. Despite his reputation as a grim, irritable man, it must be noted that Beethoven had an affable nature and, thanks to his art and charisma, he was able to attract a large network of people who forgave him some rudeness. Thus, the myth of the lonely artist is not true. Only the dream of marriage and family was denied to him. There are many anecdotes and half-truths about Beethoven. Who was Ludwig van Beethoven really, and which people and places influenced him? A biographical approach to the century artist from Germany. Ludwig spent his childhood and youth in Bonn, in German Rhineland, which was then a part of the Habsburg Empire. His grandfather came from Mechelen, Belgium, and Ludwig owes his sonorous name to him. The middle van, of which to his later regret was not a noble predicate, but rather his name means profanely as much as from the turnip garden. The Beethovens came from petty bourgeois backgrounds. His grandfather was the first Beethoven to become an artist, and the path led the Belgian to the court of the Elector in Bonn as a singer. There he rose to the position of Kapellmeister. Although grandfather Ludwig died when his famous grandson was only three, the latter adored his grandfather and he always used to give the grandfather's portrait a place of honor in his apartment during all his many moves in Vienna. His son Johann also became an employed musician in Bonn. He married Maria Magdalena, who came from a family of modest wealth. Her father was a court kitchen inspector. The 24-year-old had been married for a short time, but her husband died shortly after the wedding. Otherwise, not much is known about Ludwig's mother except for her ancestry, let alone a picture. Ludwig was born in this house on Bongasse. The date of baptism is recorded as December 27, 1770 but the effective date of birth is unknown. He was the second-born child of a total of six children. Three children were to live to adulthood. Ludwig maintained a close relationship with these two younger brothers, Kaspar and Karl, throughout his life. When Ludwig was five years old, the Beethovens moved to the more spacious house in Rheingasse. As a professional musician, Father Johann recognized his son's talent. Certain sources report violent attacks on little Ludwig during music lessons, caused by the father's drinking, although it's unclear whether these were regular or isolated incidents. In any case, Johann was wise and he gave the education of his son into foreign professional hands. The measure bore fruit and Ludwig was allowed to show his piano skills in front of an audience for the first time at the age of seven. Ludwig could consider himself lucky. Both his piano teacher Nefe as well as his later violin teacher Reicha were excellent musicians. Especially the lessons with Nefe, who was himself a composer, stimulated the young Ludwig as he was allowed to publish his first work at the age of 12. Beethoven spent his first 21 years in Bonn. Many acquaintances and connections from his Bonn years lasted throughout his life and he was able to profit much from this Bonn network later on. First and foremost is the elector Maximilian Franz. He was the youngest offspring of the imperial couple and brother of several Habsburg regents during Beethoven's Viennese period. He was incredibly fond of music and had a large music library, including many works by Mozart, whom he knew well personally from his Viennese days. He was an enlightened and prudent regent. As a so-called reform regent, 
he was even willing to support the so-called Bonn Reading Society. This was a group of influential citizens that had arisen from a circle of former members of the Illuminati, a secret, forbidden Enlightenment order. Beethoven came into personal contact with many of these personalities during his youth. The already mentioned Ries and Neve were his most important music teachers. Nikolaus Simrock played the flute in the same orchestra as Ludwig and was entrusted with the procurement of the musical materials. He subsequently founded the music publishing house Simrock and became the most important publisher of Beethoven's music during Beethoven's time in Vienna. The head of the Illuminati was Eulogius Schneider, a gifted and fiery orator who taught at the university. Schneider exercised great influence on the young Beethoven. Through him and the circle of Illuminati, Beethoven came into contact with the ideals of the French Revolution, and he was deeply influenced by these people in his political attitude. Noblemen were also part of the Bonn Reading Society, and Count von Waldstein became one of his most important early patrons. Of his Bonn friends, first and foremost are the von Bräunings. Here in this house, Beethoven became acquainted with the warm family as a young piano teacher of the children, and he was united in a cordial relationship with Helene von Bräuning, who stood by him as an important mentor in his youth. In this educated bourgeois house, people read, discussed and made music, and Beethoven, who was only allowed to enjoy an inadequate school education, was able to catch up on much here. Daughter Eleonore became his first love, and later he would have liked to take her to Vienna as a companion. But despite affection, Eleonore was not ready for a relationship. The childhood friends of the same age, Stefan von Bräuning, Franz Wegeler and Ferdinand Ries, were also Beethoven's companions in Vienna for a longer period of time and actively supported the bachelor Beethoven there. Ries was Beethoven's student and assistant for several years and later, together with Bräuning, he wrote a an important Beethoven biography to which we owe many anecdotes. We should also mention Johann Peter Solomon, 20 years his senior, who became an influential impresario in London and lured Haydn to the English capital with a lot of money. It was he who later arranged for Beethoven to get support from Haydn. This shows that Beethoven despite his well-known image as a grumpy artist, was able to build cordial and sustainable relationship and chose people as friends who shared his high ideals. This enlightened Bonn environment became a formative constant in Beethoven's young life, and its role in the Viennese years cannot be overestimated. The electors supported Beethoven wherever he could, Already at the age of 14, Ludwig received a permanent position as second organist, which was paid with a handsome 150 florins, which corresponded to half of his father's salary and meant a nice supplement for the family. He received further encouragement from the violin lessons of Anton Ries, later became a violinist in the court orchestra and wrote his first works for string instruments at the age of 15. But it was his talent for improvisation on the pianoforte that attracted the most attention, and his teacher Neve published about a 13-year-old Beethoven in a professional magazine. This young genius deserved support that he could travel. He would certainly become a second Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, if he progressed as he began. The elector Maximilian shared his assessment and he organized and financed a trip to Vienna in 1786, where he arranged for Beethoven to meet Mozart. Whether Beethoven actually met Mozart there is not certain. In any case, no lessons took place. Possibly the meeting was ill-starred. For one thing, the musical chemistry may not have been right. 
Although Beethoven admired Mozart's music, Mozart's Rococo-inspired nuanced playing was too far removed from Beethoven's hot-blooded style. Moreover, in that year of 1786, Mozart was in a hectic phase between Le Nozze di Figaro and Don Giovanni, and probably did not have his mind free for a less lucrative student from the provinces. Thus, Beethoven moved back from Vienna to his native Bonn without any countable results. Having returned there, his life was about to take two dramatic turns. The first turn concerned his family, for his return had taken on a sad note. His mother was dying. Her death in 1787 marked the beginning of a sad chapter in the family's history. His father became unstable and began to lose control over the already considerable consumption of alcohol. Quickly the family's modest fortune melted away and just two years later the father was suspended from court service. Wisely, the regent decided to pay out part of the pension to Ludwig for family welfare, which meant that the 19-year-old was given responsibility for the family, including his father, in one fell swoop. An enormous additional burden for the princely employee Beethoven, who was still in training and who was on his way to build a career also as composer. In the meantime, Count Ernst von Waldstein had entered his life, and he became his most important patron and sponsor during his last years in Bonn. He instinctively recognized the 18-year-old's potential and commissioned his first work, a knight's ballet. In 1792, Beethoven made another important encounter. The aforementioned Johann Peter Silamon stopped in Bonn on his way from London. In tow, he had the then greatest composer in Europe, Joseph Haydn. Haydn, himself a Freemason, visited the Reading Society and Solomon organized a meeting with Beethoven. The 60-year-old Haydn was impressed by the 22-year-old and was ready to accept him as his pupil in Vienna. Now things moved quickly. Maximilian and Count Waldstein farsightedly agreed to pay Ludwig a pension over several years, thus giving him the opportunity to grow artistically in Vienna. As a farewell, the friends created a family album in which Waldstein wrote the famous words Through uninterrupted diligence you will receive Mozart's spirit from Haydn's hands. Beethoven now set out for Vienna. As planned, he took lessons with Haydn and he impressed the art-minded Viennese aristocracy as a piano virtuoso. Especially his ability to improvise attracted attention in the evening societies of the aristocratic houses. Beethoven was aware that he needed the aristocracy to keep his head above water financially and he quickly managed to work out a network among the highest nobility. His first and most important sponsor and patron in his first years was Lichnowsky, who became the bearer of the dedication of Beethoven's Opus I. Beethoven had come at the right moment for him, because shortly before, his large brother Mozart, from which Lichnowsky had supported as a patron, had died. Lichnowsky deserved a curious position in the history of music, as he had a sensational confrontation with two geniuses in his life. With Mozart, he conducted a spectacular lawsuit to collect steep debts. And with Beethoven, he is connected by one of the most famous anecdotes, when over the years there was an increasing estrangement between the two. The situation escalated during Beethoven's stay at Graz Castle, the prince's residence. Namely, in August 1811, he was glad to get away from the hated French occupiers in Vienna for a while. Beethoven initially spent idyllic weeks at the castle, but one evening the prince wanted Beethoven to play for his visitors. However, the visitors were French officers and Beethoven refused to play for the hated occupiers, resulting in a heated argument between the two. 
Beethoven left the castle immediately. The next morning, the prince is said to have received a letter with the famous words, Prince, what you are, you are by chance and birth. What I am, I am by myself. There will be thousands more princes. Beethoven exists only once. The prince suspended his support and the long-standing relationship ended. Let us return to his Viennese network. The second important patron was Prince von Lobkowitz. When he met Beethoven, he was 20 year old and music crazy. He owned a large town palace where he had a hall set up for concerts. He spent vast sums on orchestral musicians and became a generous patron of the arts. Among other things, the premiere of the Third Symphony took place in this palace. Lobkowitz's importance as a patron is illustrated by the fact that he was the dedicatee of the Third, Fifth and Sixth Symphonies, among others. Lobkowitz, along with Kinski and the Archduke, was also partly responsible for the pension that Beethoven received in the last 20 years of his life. More of this later. Beethoven wrote his first Viennese works for intimate forms such as chamber music or piano. In 1795 the time had come and he made his first public appearance in Vienna as a pianist with his piano concerto in B-flat major. However, he did not achieve his breakthrough until shortly before the age of 30, when he wrote the first catchy tunes and mega-hits of the beginning Romantic period, first with the Pathetic and then with the Moonlight Sonata. In the meantime, many things had happened in the family. Shortly after Beethoven's arrival in Vienna, his father had died. A few years later, his two brothers moved to Vienna. One, Nikolaus, studied pharmacy in Vienna and became a successful pharmacist, first in Vienna and later in Linz. Kaspar Karl first flirted with the profession of musician, but then decided to pursue a career as a civil servant. He worked in the financial sector and later began to assist his famous brother in marketing his works. Beethoven greatly appreciated the assistance, for Karl was a demanding and persistent negotiator and soon, to the delight of his brother Ludwig, he was hated by all publishers. Ludwig had a cordial relationship with both brothers and in both cases it was precisely their marriage that marred the relationship with him. The suspicious Ludwig had an extremely bad opinion of both sisters-in-law. In the case of his brother Nicholas, he even tried to obtain a ban on the marriage from the bishop in his place of residence in Linz, which understandably irritated his brother. In the case of his brother Karl, the relationship with the sister-in-law was even more disrupted, which was to have serious consequences, of which later. Some friends from Bonn also came to Vienna. Thanks to their later records, we know a lot about Beethoven's life. Breuning actively assisted him and Beethoven was often at his home. Breuning even helped him out temporarily for, as a librettist for Fidelio and he later commented that Beethoven had been a real effort. In 1802, Beethoven stayed in Heiligenstadt for a cure. Already at the age of 30, frequent physical complaints became noticeable. However, he was most concerned about his progressive hearing problems. Beethoven was aware that this ailment would not only impair his artistic development, but also would lead to his social isolation. In this deep crisis, he wrote a testament-like, heart-trending text about his suffering, his fears, but also his determination to assert himself as an artist against all odds. Possibly there was a second trigger for the life crisis, besides the physical problems, namely the broken relationship with a woman. Beethoven had fallen in love with a female piano student. As so often later, Beethoven got his hopes up and wrote in a letter to Wegeler about marriage. He even dedicated the Moonlight Sonata to Giulietta Guicciardi. But the beloved did not accept. 
Beethoven was shaken. Wegeler later stated laconically in his notes that Beethoven had been in love very often, but mostly only for a short time. Indeed, in the next years, Beethoven's crushes changed frequently. The list of young women listed here is not exhaustive. But from his correspondence, one can sense the growing despair that he might have to give up his life's dream of marriage and a family due to the distinction in class, since all his crushes came from the nobility, and due to his progressive deafness. Time and again, Beethoven believed himself to be close to the goal. In his relationship with his piano pupil, Teresa Malfatti, who was 20 years younger than him, for example, Beethoven had already obtained the baptismal certificate necessary for marriage. The sad climax of this decade-long drama was the letter to the immortal beloved, found in his estate. Beethoven was 42 years old when he wrote the famous three-part letter in a bohemian spa. There are two unanswered questions surrounding this significant piece of writing. The first question is why the document was found in Beethoven's estate. Did he not send it at all or was it returned to him? The second question revolves around the question of who the addressee was. Beethoven doted on many women during these years and the research on this reads like a detective story. According to the current state of knowledge, two women have been shortlisted. One candidate is Antonia Brentano, who was also in Bohemia at the time when Beethoven wrote the letter. The story of the second candidate has some explosive power. The Hungarian-born Josefine von Daim, nie Brunswick, was perhaps the most significant, long-lasting female constant in his adult life. The course of the relationship was as it often was. He made advances to his piano student and she married another and bore children. Her husband died early, however, and Beethoven again saw his chance. He had remained her piano teacher and thus had kept in close contact. However, despite presumably strong feelings, a relationship with the composer was out of the question for Josephine as she would have lost her noble status and, even worse, custody of her children. The relationship continued and it is suspected that it was more than just friendship for a long time. Interestingly, Josephine had illegitimate children in two cases, both times by private tutors who taught in the Brunswick home. Since Beethoven's taught her, It cannot be excluded that Josephine had a child by Beethoven, for there is a candidate. In 1813, almost exactly nine months after the writing of the letter to the immortal beloved, Josephine gave birth to Theresia Cornelia, called by Josephine only Minona. Minona is called anonym backwards, and a picture from Theresia Cornelia's late years shows a striking resemblance to a certain Ludwig van Beethoven. But it is not proven. Let us return to the year of the Heiligenstadt Testament. What followed this event can be described with no other word than that of a creative frenzy. The year 1804 meant a turning point in Beethoven's creative life. He broke free from his life crisis with a violent eruption and wrote the Waldstein Sonata, which, with its frenzied pulse, created a turning point in piano music. Shortly thereafter, a musical evolution took place in Prince Lobkowitz's palace. In a private concert, before a hand-picked audience, the Eroica, his third symphony, was heard for the first time. Everyone in the room recognized that Beethoven had opened a new door in music history with this work. The work begins with the two famous forward strokes that literally seem to sweep away a century of music history and lead to boldness that was unheard before. 
With the Eroica, Beethoven also outed himself as a political revolutionary. This is shown by the fact that Beethoven had originally dedicated the work to the subversive Napoleon and grotesquely had it financed by a high member of the Viennese nobility, Napoleon's declared political enemy. But when Napoleon crowned himself emperor shortly thereafter, thus depriving Beethoven of all illusions, Beethoven, in a holy rage, erased the dedication without further ado, to which the famous hole in the first page of the autograph still bears witness today. What followed were his golden years. Masterpiece followed masterpiece. With each of these works, Beethoven created something new, never standing still, always striving for the highest standards. Perhaps these five years were the most glorious compositional period ever had by a composer of classical music. In 1812, Beethoven was stripped of a living mask. The process of creating it was extremely unpleasant. He had liquid plaster applied to his face, which was only slowly tightened, while quills protruded from his nose and mouth to allow him to breathe. On the first attempt, he tore the mask away in panic, but the second attempt worked. What remained was a scowling expression that forever shaped the Beethoven image of subsequent generations. In fact, from the description of his contemporaries, we recognize a quick-tempered character, but one that could also be endearing and humorous. Again and again, the condition of his dwelling was the subject of reports. The chaos in Beethoven's apartments must have been impressive. From the 40th years of his life onwards, reports accumulated from visitors who reported puddles of water, a dusty grand piano, and even chamber pots that had not been emptied. Accordingly, there was an enormous turnover of house servants, each of whom escaped Beethoven's chaos and mania for control after a short period of service. Beethoven was aware of his temper, and knew that he sometimes hurt his friends and put them to a severe test. But he was also ready to make a conciliatory gesture. To excuse him, it must be said that he was burdened by many physical problems and that a considerable part of his interpersonal problems were due to his hearing problem, which sometimes made it impossible for him to hit the right note. With the year 1811, a storm began to brew over Beethoven and eight difficult years began. The beginning was the collapse of the Habsburg currency due to the financial burden of the war against Napoleon. As a result, Beethoven's pension lost massive value. This weighed all the more as his hearing problems increasingly limited his performance opportunities. One must keep in mind that at this time composers could sell their works only once and had no further exploitation rights. In practice, composers had to rely on the income from concerts, but Beethoven had to practically stop concert activities from the age of 40. The most difficult time came in the famine year of 1816, the so-called year without summer, when, to the volcanic eruption in Indonesia, there were only 30 rain-free days during eight months, and the unripe harvest rotted in the fields, throwing the country into a gigantic crisis. Beethoven was like all the Viennese. His economic situation deteriorated rapidly, and from the age of 45, he had to fear an old age in poverty. The family situation was also getting out of hand. In 1815, brother Kaspar died, leaving behind a widow and son, Karl. In Karl, Beethoven now found the son he was never allowed to have, and he began a long-standing dispute with the hated sister-in-law over custody, repeatedly going to court. 
He got completely lost in his holy rage and even defamed her in court as a whore, just to get custody. Karl even lived with Beethoven for some time, but this did not work out, as the chaotic Beethoven wanted to dictate everything to Kaspar. Soon Kaspar fled to his mother and Beethoven arranged for Kaspar to be placed in a prestigious boarding school. The disputes dragged on for many years and they put a great strain on Beethoven. The hearing problem worsened. From about 1813 on, Beethoven used ear trumpets to communicate with his surroundings and from 1818 on he could only converse in writing. For this purpose he possessed so-called conversation notebooks in which his interlocutors could enter their verbal messages and they became important sources about the Beethoven of the late years. Much of it concerned everyday things, but he also used them as a memory aids and one could, for example, reconstruct his medical treatment in detail. Typhoid fever, jaundice and a constant colic made Beethoven's life miserable. Accordingly, the number of doctors consulted as well as therapies, medications and cures started was large. In more recent times, hair samples have been repeatedly analyzed and a significant proportion of the problems seem to be associated with lead poisoning. Lead was in present in many foods at that time, especially in wine to which Beethoven was considerably addicted. During this troubled period, Beethoven found little leisure for composing. The most important work from this period is the Missa Solemnis, which Beethoven, however, counted among his most successful compositions. Around 1820, Beethoven was able to breathe again. He was granted legal guardianship over his nephew and he spent the rest of his youth in a boarding school. Financially, too, the situation relaxed again. Only the incessant health problems remained for Beethoven. Most remarkably, however, his practically complete deafness did not prevent Beethoven from crowning his old age work with an astonishing innovative power. With the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven reinvented the genre and from then on, every promising composer who was to compose a symphony was measured against this work. Also in the piano over the three last sonatas opened new doors, and one is astonished that at the time of the composition, Haydn had died only a little more than ten years before. Especially touching is the grandiose arietta of the last of these three sonatas, which carries a wonderful melancholy, and already five years before his death, a transfigured farewell mood. In his last years, Beethoven was virtually tormented by liver problems, jaundice, watch retention, pneumonia, and so on, so that he was released in 1827 after a two-day death struggle. 20,000 people lined the transport of the coffin from his home in the Schwarzspanier House to the Weringer Cemetery. In 1888, the body was reburied and found a grave of honor at the Vienna Central Cemetery next to Mozart's grave of honor. <laughs> 